All right, we'll call the meeting to order. Remind everyone to mute your phones or computers or whatever device you happen to be uh, using. Uh, all three commissioners are present in the courtroom, 301 in the Jim Thorpe building. And uh, if each of the commissioners would announce their presence verbally. And Todd Hyatt is present. Bob Anthony present. Dana Murphy present. All right, there is a quorum uh, present. Notice is proper. And the usual reminder that if for some reason we are disconnected, um, we will reestablish connection or attempt to reestablish connection at 2.30 p.m. And Ms. Mitchell, are you on the line and would you present today's agendas, please? Yes, sir, I'm on the line. I do need to make a couple of announcements before we begin. Um, the agenda that was posted had the daily docket orders attached to the agenda. However, those orders, if they were approved by the commissioners, were processed this morning. And also, on the 24-hour agenda, there are a couple of items that were not necessarily on the, the signing agenda, but they were on the summary sheet that was attached also. So the 24-hour items are uh, posted in one way or another. I just wanted to make sure you knew that um, before I started. All right. Thank so you for that clarification. The agenda, yes. On the agenda for Tuesday, July 14th, 2020 at 1 30 p.m. submitted for your vote are the following proposed orders. There are 14 PUDs on the 24-hour agenda. We have PUD 2020-19, an order dismissing cause. 2020-28, final order approving joint stipulation and settlement agreement. 2020-38, order establishing procedural schedule. However, I received a, a communication from Jeff Klein that he would like to strike that order. Um, and I believe he said he would be available for questions if, if needed. We also have two orders in PUD 2020-55. There's an order establishing procedural schedule and an order granting motion for protective order. There's a P PUD 2020-56 final order approving tariff revisions. We have three orders titled Final Order Approving Amendment to Interconnection Agreement, and they are in PUD 2020-59, 2020-60, and 2020-61. There are three orders in PUD 2020-67. There's an order granting motion for order prescribing notice, an order granting motion to establish procedural schedule, and an order granting motion for protective order. And there are two orders in PUD 2020-68, there's an order granting motion for order prescribing notice and an order granting motion to establish procedural schedule. All right, thank you, Peggy. And as Peggy has noted, we have handled the daily agenda <clears throat> earlier today, and so we will move straight to the 24 hour agenda. If it's okay with uh, my fellow commissioners, we will hold PUD 20 28 and handle it separately and take up the balance of the 24-hour agenda. Are there questions or comments on the 24-hour agenda, with exception of 20-28? Seeing no questions, Peggy, would you call the roll on that portion, please? Commissioner Hyatt? Aye. Commissioner Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy. Aye. Thank you. We will now turn to um, on the 24, once again, on the 24 hour agenda, uh, 20. No, I said 28. Is it 28 or 22? 28. 28. Okay. I've got a typo here. Um, we will turn to 2020 28. Uh, the center center point PBR, and I would ask Kurt Long if you're on the line, would you please discuss that uh, settlement agreement? Yes, Commissioner, members of the commission, uh, this is a proposed final order for consideration in uh, Center Point Energy's annual PBR review on March 13th. The company filed its calculations under the PBR tariff, and uh, they uh, revealed a, 
uh, refund or a credit back to customers in the amount of one billion nine hundred and seventy two dollars and seven seven hundred and sixty one dollars I, I garbled that let me try it again uh, one million nine hundred and seventy two thousand seven hundred and sixty one dollars that was the amount of the initial uh, proposal by Centerpoint in its initial filings. Uh, after extensive audit and discovery, the PUD filed uh, their testimony proposing adjustments that would have increased, uh, would have had the effect of increasing that credit. Uh, the Attorney General filed his testimony uh, with respect to separate adjustments uh, that would have increased that refund or credit. Uh, so we had three different uh, and separate positions of the parties. Uh, they met together uh, in a series of settlement conferences that resulted in a unanimous stipulation of all parties in the case. And that is the stipulation that uh, the administrative law judge approved in the hearing on the merits and that is recommended for you in the order that I uh, understand is before you. Uh, the essential terms of the stipulation, there are essentially five paragraphs that are the meat of the terms of the stipulation. Uh, paragraph five provides for a compromise credit in the aggregate amount of $2.46 million uh, to all customers. And of course, that is uh, greater than the initial proposal by Centerpoint, and it is within the range of positions of the parties in the case, and therefore the parties believe that it is a fair, just, and reasonable compromise. You'll see in the stipulation also that uh, that aggregate amount of uh, $2,460,000 will result in uh, a customer impact for the average residential customer on the, in the amount of $1.64 per month for 12 months. Uh, that would be returned over a period of 12 months per, uh, per the tariff, um, uh, and that is going to be subject to true up. Uh, that credit, the PBR credit that is agreed and stipulated and compromised is in addition to the EDIT credit that I'll get to in a moment. Uh, in paragraph two, there is an agreement for one of the Contested issues, there was a, some legal expense on some litigation, right-of-way litigation that uh, was contested, and the parties agreed that there would be some of that disallowed and some of it allowed. The amount that would be allowed is the amount that you see there, $215,500, that would be amortized over a three-year period. And during the period of amortization, uh, that amount would not be included in a rate base and, of course, would not be uh, drawing any kind of return. Um, that is a result of some uh, litigation up in Osage County. I think uh, Commissioner Murphy asked about that a few weeks ago in an abandonment order that was before you that you approved, and uh, that was the subject of dispute, and it has now been settled, and what you see there is the result of that settlement discussion and compromise. Paragraph three is uh, uh, the uh, uh, return, specification of the return of the protected and uh, unprotected EDIT credit. Uh, the aggregate amount there is $471,062, and that would be returned to customers, has been returned actually to customers as of last April of 2020. Uh, in, in the uh, broken down uh, customer classes that you see there in, in the order and in the stipulation. Uh, and number, paragraph four is the annual uh, energy efficiency incentive and, and true up. The adjustments are relatively minor. You see them set out there for each customer class. And finally, uh, on paragraph five is, is a little bit of an unusual provision, but the parties have agreed. We've had, as the commission knows, we've had some disputes over the years over uh, in, in litigation context of how best to uh, improve on the PBR tariff. And the parties have agreed that rather than litigating those year after year, what we will try to do is have a, uh, an ongoing settlement discussion between now and next year's filing. 
uh, parties have agreed to meet and confer. Uh, there's a schedule in there uh, that you'll see that in which the parties agree that the center point will first make a proposal and then the public utility division as well as the AG will have an opportunity to make proposals and then there will be a meet and confer after that and subsequent meetings as necessary, hopefully to get some kind of an agreement or compromise that uh, would be workable for the ongoing uh, PBR process. Uh, you'll see that the parties have specified that that is a, a settlement discussion uh, would be confidential uh, under the typical settlement rules. So those are the uh, high level uh, uh, terms and conditions of the stipulation and the order before you uh, recommended by the, the uh, uh, administrative law judge and, and signed off on by uh, all the parties is proposed for uh, your approval. Thank you, Mr. Long. Are there questions of the commissioners? Commissioner Murphy. Um, Mr. Long, I'm sorry that uh, I wasn't able to get this to you and the other commissioners sooner. I've just been tied up on a lot of other issues, but I'm looking at um, the, on page 7 of 14 on the proposed order, paragraph 1, 2, 3, paragraph number 4 where it starts out commission further fines and it talks about the stipulation should be approved us and such. I compared the language that begins accordingly the commission makes no policy decisions or endorsement of recovery methodologies which I believe similar language was changed in the ONG stipulation and I have the ONG stipulation order and it reads in approving the stipulation the Commission accepts that it is a settlement based upon the facts and circumstances as presented in this cause and not binding in future proceedings before the Commission. And I believe this similar language that is in the center point order about no policy decisions or endorsements of recovery methodologies and thus and such, that was modified and the language I mentioned in the ONG was put in. So um, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill and I, I just am looking for consistency and I'm sorry I just didn't have time to bring this up with the other commissioners. The language in the ONG matter is the one that I prefer but if the other commissioners are willing to go along with this, I just feel like consistency's sake, I don't want to come to another place with another stipulation, and then all of a sudden we're dealing with four or five versions of a language that we agreed to some time ago. And that's what has happened to get us where we are today, even on the ONG case. It was like we had agreed to some language before, and the next thing we know, here's language that we had modified before. And this happens a lot. So it, it seems like we've kind of weighed in on the language that we prefer. So I, I don't know why that language isn't utilized in these orders. So that's kind of my question. And I guess it would be a little bit more of a question to the other commissioners. If they want the language changed, it seems like that could be mm, relatively easily changed. And I don't think it would change the pagination. On page 6 of 8, we've got more lengthy things on the rest of today's signing agenda. So I think if the other commissioners wanted to adjust that language, it could be done relatively um, easily and simply. But Mr. Long, I'll, I'll kind of, I'm kind of asking a question and kind of making a statement. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. Mr. Long, before you respond, can you help me? I, I'm having a hard time finding the language. That okay, page to. page 7 on 14 oh, okay. and it is the fourth paragraph down from the top okay. beginning with the commission further finds that the stipulation the language that I have have which we changed in the ONG matter it says accordingly the commission makes no policy decisions or endorsement of recovery methodologies to be relied on or to be viewed as binding in future proceedings I think that language was similar in the ONG order and we changed it to in approving the stipulation the commission accepts that it is a settlement based on the facts and circumstances as presented in this cause and not binding in future proceedings before the commission. We didn't make some point about policy decisions and, and 
I don't know how big of an issue it is, but we've changed this before, and then I don't know what happens. We keep winding up with orders that don't go back to the language we had suggested before. So that was really my point. Mr. Long, do you care to respond? Uh, yes, uh, commissioners. Uh, first of all, there was no intent uh, to uh, cause a different interpretation between those two sets of language. I don't have that ONG language in front of me now that's in uh, the ONG final order, but there was there was no intent to uh, cause a different result or a different interpretation. Uh, I will say that the order that's in front of you now was drafted, uh, reviewed by the parties, submitted to the ALJ. Uh, I believe that was before the uh, ONG order was before you and before you made that change. So. Uh, there was no intent to go back to some kind of previous language. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think that there was any objection to the ONG language. I, I, and from what you read, Commissioner Murphy, uh, sounds like it's the same language to me. Uh, I don't think that's a, that's an issue that uh, uh, certainly Centerpoint would, would raise as a problem. Well, I, I believe last time I sent the language around, I mentioned it at the um, signing agenda, and we it was accepted and we didn't have any issue nobody that was on the on the call spoke up and said they didn't agree i don't think it changes the substance of the order i just can't understand why we keep having all these different versions and that's really my point and i apologize that i i just didn't have time and i just didn't focus on it because i presumed it was going to be the same and then when i looked at it about 10 minutes ago i realized it wasn't would you read the ong language again in approving the stipulation, the Commission accepts that it is a settlement based upon the facts and circumstances as presented in this cause and not binding and future proceedings before the Commission. I'm fine with either language. I think they both do communicate the same points, but it may be better uh, better worded in the ONG if we uh, if we were to replace that sentence, what, what does that do to us? I think that we could, um, if Commissioner Anthony is in agreement, I think I could just look to my office to take the, I don't know if we have the Word version of the document, but I know that we also have somebody who can change PDFs. Um, I think she's become a pro at that now. So my office could put that language into this page I don't think it's going to change the pagination, okay. and then I think we could get it done before the meeting concludes today. Okay. Commissioner Anthony, do you have a thought? I'll support uh, that approach. Okay. Uh, I will as well, so uh, we will just ask that... Um, okay. Kenneth, if you can coordinate with Erica and make sure that that gets done, and then provide that to Mr. Long and provide that to the other commissioners, that'd be great. Thank you. And to Peggy. All right. Any further questions or comments on Centerpoint? If not, um, well, I, I did uh, just comment, uh, not a question, but uh, Mr. Long, to your point, you talked about the tariff discussion. I, I, I am pleased that those discussions will be um, occurring going forward, and and hope that they hope that they are fruitful. We shall see the next time we do this, I suppose, but. Um, and has and Mr. Long and others have stated too. This is a black box settlement, and so um, as that language points out, uh, not endorsing every methodology that was used in this process, but uh, but an overall settlement. Settlement, uh, I would agree to support. And so, with that, Peggy, if you would please call the roll on 20-28. Commissioner Hyatt. Aye. Mr. Anthony? Aye. Commissioner Murphy? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to agenda item number three, uh, which is uh, the, the potential extension of 2020-01. Um, Mr. Rhodes. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Tim Rhodes, Director of Administration. Um, commissioners, you have before you the third uh, the proposed third uh, extension of your uh, original in interim order entered uh, on March 17th, which 
as you know, basically allows for um, uh, adjustments and modifications to be made uh, by myself in conjunction with uh, the director of uh, JLS to enable, uh, better enable the commission to posture itself to work remotely and, and be nimble and respond to ever-changing uh, conditions arising from the uh, global pandemic. And I believe uh, that there's a modified version that's been uh, circulated uh, um, uh, after the, uh, the initial proposed uh, order um, uh, was uh, drafted and, and distributed, I believe, late last week that uh, is now before you for consideration. I would urge uh, that it be uh, uh, entered and approved. Thank you. And the, um, the order that you have before you that, uh, that the other commissioners have had opportunity to see actually accomplishes uh, the same thing. It's just, it's just removing a lot of language that was um, not necessary language. For simplification, uh, correct, Commissioner. I, I I believe it's more succinct and uh, it, it, it it accomplishes the same substantive uh, purposes, and I would certainly uh, urge its adoption. All right. Questions or Commissioner Hyatt, commission? are you talking about the version from your office? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm clear. Thank you. Yes. And then um, I think we have the uh, version that Natasha Scott. Uh, circulated. We have the version that uh, Commissioner Hyatt's office circulated uh, in red line form and then in uh, completed form. And then I have a version that I'd like to describe. You got one that had blue, some of them had red, but it's the same thing. This is right. Um, so let me offer a few comments, if, if that's appropriate at this time. Absolutely. Okay. And um, if it uh, seems I'm uh, rather uh, affected by all this, I think I, I am. I just came back from the Rotary meeting, and uh, now this will affect you. Mike Turpin, Todd Lamb, and the head of Channel 4, were in one of those flashpoint type uh, deals, but they all made reference to uh, something that I gave a news article, uh, I think I put one on Commissioner Murphy's desk, and here's one here, uh, that the uh, just within the last couple of hours, they gave the number uh, of new coronaviruses in Oklahoma that uh, came out uh, for the previous 24-hour period, and it's an all-time record of 993. Uh, earlier today, I circulated uh, some graphs to the other offices that come from the Oklahoma State Department of Health presentation of figures, and I guess I'd like to make reference to uh, the uh, what we call the bar chart first. And uh, so you can see that prior to this most recent figure of 993, there was one somewhat over 800. So if we added with a red pencil uh, the most recent line, it, it would go up. Uh, Mr. Rhodes just made reference to March uh, 17 uh, as a time of our original order. Well, if you look at uh, March uh, 19 is shown there, but of those few days, there's hardly a, a little blip on the screen. And so what we've done is uh, it seemed relatively flat for a while, but then in June it just uh, took off like a rocket. And so um, I guess in a, in a layman's uh, way of thinking, if there were... Um, 100 people I was going to run into, whatever the chance of getting the virus is uh, today, with so many more that exist, uh, it's a whole lot higher than it was in uh, March and April. The other uh, chart that I shared with the other offices is what I'm going to call a line uh, graph. And it's... It's, it's a cumulative total. So obviously it's adding each new day. And if you add 
993, then it's going to shoot it up close to another thousand. Um, and uh, you know, I think that uh, it weighs upon us to serve the public, and this is a time that uh, Commissioner Murphy usually uh, has the lead in making sure we communicate with our uh, staff uh, people that uh, we do care about their health and safety. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, there obviously are, with over 500 people involved in this agency, there are ones that are fall in different categories of uh, uh, the age risk, the health risk, the circumstance. Um, and so not only that, but I know of some people that work here that um, are what I'm going to call young and healthy and not in a risk category, but their parents or grandparents are. And so I, I know all of us know these stories and we uh, see them on the news almost every night as well. Uh, so here's what, uh, I, and I did spend a considerable amount of time comparing uh, Natasha's draft to the uh, red line that Commissioner Hyatt's office shared. And uh, long story short, I'd like to reinstate um, five of the paragraphs. In other words, put them back in instead of take them out. Um, I know that there were some edits and so forth, and so I'm willing to accept all of the edits or the uh, modifications that occurred other places. My order of preference is uh, really the one at the bottom, and I'm on page two of uh, four, that um, the last line uh, says, and for continued efforts to protect the health and safety of commission employees and the public. And I think to put that in there says a lot. I, I don't think he carbon copied the whole building, but Brandy Reith uh, was listening in last time we had a meeting, uh, which was last week, and we talked about these related issues, and uh, he thought uh, that he was very proud of the fact that we uh, gave a considerable um, emphasis to the safety of our staff. And uh, so I think putting that uh, paragraph in there that explicitly says that is important. Um, I would also now jump to the top of the page and uh, before we move forward, yes. if I make a comment, it, that language is in the uh, order from my office. If you look at page two of three. Okay, hang on just a second. I want to get to see if I got it. Okay, I've got the one the from last your office. There are only two. Page two of three. Page two of three at the top. There are only two um, sentences, but the, the last one I think is pertinent to the language that you were uh, concerned. The uh, ongoing and ever-changing nature of the pandemic and the quickly increasing number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Oklahoma necessitate the need to maintain flexibility in the Commission's administrative processes and procedures, continued adherence to governmental COVID-19 guidance, and for continued efforts to protect the health and safety of the Commission employees and the public. So that language is... It did, okay. Well, did remain in the, hey, thank in the you version. for that. Yes. Uh, okay. And I'm now trying to quickly... Uh, I believe that what I need to say is um, I apologize, but also when that's read, um, we'll take that out. And and that now looking at what you've just uh, pointed out to me, it's um, it's at the bottom of my page two in black which means it is just as you explained it. So it's already there. Correct. Uh, with a slight uh, modification. Okay, so I uh, think that's already covered, so I don't need to have the last of the four, or five, one, two, three, four, five. 
items. So now let me go to the top. Thank you. Um, we hear lots of people on the evening news and otherwise uh, talking about how these uh, decisions need to be uh, based on data, based on facts, based on science, as opposed to other things that have words that I don't even want to mention. And uh, I think the top paragraph there gives some of the history, and it and it shows that uh, when we started off, uh, there were, the numbers were very low. Remember, we thought Oklahoma was almost like, uh, what's the deal? This is all about New York and a few other places. Uh, I think for uh, each step in the process, it's it's good to be um, aware that there is this. Uh, um, it, historical trend this says it in words my little chart I handed out shows it in a graph um, and uh, the next sentences I'm sure that when Natasha helped put them in there there was a purpose to it I find that there's a benefit in quoting the uh, uh, positions that are there so long story short I Instead of leaving out those top four paragraphs um, that uh, were in the staff or Natasha's version, uh, I'd keep them. I I just I don't see any um, any I don't see that it's necessary. I, I don't I think everyone in Oklahoma is very well aware that we have many cases and it is an ongoing. Uh, concern and a battle not only for the country but also for Oklahoma um, and furthermore I, I think if people didn't know that at this point I would not think that they would go to the Oklahoma Corporation Commission office to the clerk's office and dig up this order to get that information so I, I just don't see that it's necessary I don't um, don't feel that strongly about it one way or the other but I think it just adds to it's just more paper, more words, uh, but it's it's all just restating what has happened in the past. And um, well, let's see how Commissioner Murphy feels about that it. that have expired, and um, Mr. Murphy, do you have any thoughts? I think to to make reference to the data gives the reality that we're trying to uh, make our decisions based on uh, current facts and circumstances and showing the data shows that uh, that's what we're doing. But uh, I can see it both ways. Are we just talking about the top paragraph or are we? Yeah, one okay. at a time, the top paragraph. Um, uh, I guess I don't really have that. I mean, I'm willing to go with it or go without it. I mean, I, I think the one thing I would say is that we didn't really have it and we didn't go to all this trouble in the original ones that we did, but now more time has gone by, so I recognize that. So um, I think we all want to accomplish the same thing. It's a matter of words. I kind of agree with keeping it a little, in general, a little bit more simple, and I don't think we have to keep repeating what we've already done because that's the problem that we have in a lot of orders. If we already said it before in an interim order, why do we keep repeating the same thing? This is different. I, I guess I'd be along the lines of um, it's not make or break for me. If if we all agree to put it in, fine. If we don't all agree to put it in, that's fine too. Let me see if I can quickly look at um, the bottom two, which are shorter. The third one down, which is shorter, makes reference to closure of some non-critical infrastructure businesses, remote work, and social distancing uh, remain unknown at this time. All right, the very last one says, um, extension thereof has provided much needed flexibility during the pandemic. I propose we include, um, we add to the order that's before us, uh, the two paragraphs as proposed by Commissioner Anthony, originally 
uh, proposed, of course, by Ms. Scott, um, which would be looking at the red line version, it would be paragraphs three and four. If there are five red lined paragraphs there, it would be paragraphs three and four. Okay. And and dismiss the ballot. I think that's a, a good middle ground. I appreciate your uh, patience in considering it. And uh, hey, we all know that these drafts have kind of come quickly. So that we're I would accept that the uh, thought that you just put forth, and uh, maybe we got caught in the weeds. I think there were some new words that did make it in everybody's version when it said this uh, uh, isn't meant to allow anybody to cause a necessary delay, and that this isn't necessarily some statement about whether the agencies opened or closed and all, all that. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, all the versions uh, made those clear. I, I, think, I think part of the language that I'm looking at the version that um, Commissioner Hyatt's office did, and I had a paragraph that I think I sent around to the other offices, and part of that language is included. I don't know that I, I don't know if that made it into the version that you did, Commissioner Anthony, and that was the part that you were talking about. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think the issue has been, and we discussed it last week, um, people using this order as saying that's the day that we're going to open the building. Yeah. Right. And it's been utilized for that, and I've seen some Facebook, I've got one of those printed out. And we need to make it clear it's being misinterpreted. So I think this is our opportunity to clarify it. So I think it definitely needs to have the language to me that this order isn't going to be the determination about whether the building is open and closed. And and because we're, I, I think we're seeing some people use this to their de benefit on the delay side. Uh, so I think I we think need that language. Matt Mullen could uh, respond that there it is. Yes. What page? Page three, the second one from the top, I think. Oh, there it is. So, yes, that was important for all of us, and I think that's in there. Okay, so, and then I'm looking at the paragraph down below that, and so is that the same as that's, well, Matt? That's, okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, other, otherwise, it was... Mr. Hyatt's version. All right. So this is an extension until it is a 60-day extension in this case until September the 22nd. Um, and as has been clarified by Commissioner Murphy and I, I think I heard Commissioner Anthony agree, and I totally agree that uh, that uh, we certainly want to make it clear that that these orders are for our internal operational procedures and and uh, and to help us do what we have to do and remain nimble and continue to get the people's business accomplished. Um, but in no way, shape, or form is September 22nd a set date of when we will reopen. We could reopen tomorrow, or we could reopen a week from tomorrow, or a month from tomorrow. The September 22nd, um, uh, having this operational procedure in place, in no way is any indication of when the building will be opened. All right, so, okay, I'm going to try to say this clearly, Peggy. Hopefully you've followed that along, but I think we're going to use the version that I had proposed, which you have, and following help me Nicole what which paragraph do the, the inserts need to be made following that was after the second paragraph insert it there okay. okay Peggy on the the order that you have it's it's um, how best to say this? It's just above the ordering section, uh, the ordering section, and the final. 
Peggy, I'm trying to think of how to say this without and make it clear. Um, Can I make a suggestion yes, to make do. it easier? <laughs> um, Kenneth has just taken care of the center point order, so that's been provided to Peggy. We've got some other. We got another item on the signing agenda. Yeah. Why don't we just see if your office can take care of it no. and present it back to us, and then we can take a vote on it then. Thank you. That's a good idea. I think that might save you Much a little easier. difficulty. Uh, I, I think that uh, what we have is the red line version that I handed out is Mr. Hyatt's version. Okay, it's I just, thought you made your changes to Natasha Scott's version. No, no, no. So that, I mean, okay. it's, it's really easy to say. Okay. We're taking Commissioner Hyatt's version. We're adding uh, two uh, of the smaller size paragraphs, but I'll explain them better than that. On my uh, handout on page two, one, two, the, the third and the fourth paragraphs are reestablished uh, in in Commissioner Hyatt's um, document. Okay, and we will insert those two paragraphs and, and Matt so got it to machine. you, Peggy, and so we're... Are we inserting paragraphs three and four, but not five? Correct. Okay. Only two paragraphs, and they're the third and fourth ones on the page. Correct. Page two. All right. Peggy, are you pulling your hair out yet? Have I confused you sufficiently? The good I'm news is we will... Sure. I'm very sure Sorry. that your office will provide me with what is the yes. correct version. Okay, we will do. Thank you, Peggy. So we can vote on that. Yes. So we're voting on the version that would actually be your version, Commissioner Hyatt, with the insertion of paragraphs three and four, but that would be the version that Commissioner Anthony edited and added. It's a little confusing to me. You all know what you're doing because you've been doing it. I'm just trying to look at a multiple documents. So that's why I suggested what I did. Could I just, you all know what you've done. I'm just, I don't. Okay. Well, I, th I think we're all on the same page and, and we will get that to, um, to Peggy. And uh, so for uh, so does Peggy need to call the roll? Yes. So for 2020-01, uh, uh, Peggy, would you please call the roll? Commissioner Hyatt. Aye. Commissioner Anthony. Aye. Commissioner Murphy. I'm not clear on what I'm voting on, so I don't really know what to vote. So I guess if the other two want to vote on what they think they're voting on, that's fine. And I just won't vote because I don't know what I'm supposed to be voting on. You got two yeses and one maybe, Peggy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's move to agenda item number four, which is Commissioner Anthony's posting. So Commissioner Actually, Anthony, you recognize. Uh, Roman numeral five. Is that print? Is? It's four on my agenda. It's, okay. okay but, uh, Roman numeral yes. four. We've had so many drafts. Um, thank you. Well, in our discussion of um, old cases, first of all, I think that's a business-like thing to do. Uh, you know, you... Uh, you can't manage your business unless you know what it is. And to look at the, uh, uh, the plans, or sometimes they say plan your work and work your plan. I found one of my big, thick file folders over here, and it says old cases. And we've uh, periodically looked at backlogs and tried to identify uh, where we needed to pay attention. Um, this file folder has a section on stale data. If cases, like particularly utility cases, get really old and the data is stale, and then we have to go back. Uh, I even, for your recollection, I remember when we talked about this, um, we still regulate cotton gin rates. And uh, the last time we said in order to do that was uh, 1981. So maybe in nine, uh, 
2021 we could have a 40 year uh, anniversary of, of uh, the rape case. Uh, but, th but that order was issued. All right. We have been talking about um, whether with the virus uh, certain cases were um, old and hearings not held. And I won't try and get into this because too much because it's not my area of personal experience. But um, the notion that contested oil and gas cases uh, have to have person-to-person -person hearings uh, to get resolution, I think, is not accurate. Uh, there's lots of other uh, forums where people conduct things uh, electronically even before the, the virus, and, uh, and this agency is one of them. I know that staff has given some attention to uh, what cases exactly are we talking about? And last time we spoke, we made reference to a number like 200 cases, and we know that uh, they've been looked at. And quite frankly, uh, those who have explained that study or report to me indicated that uh, most of those are applications for horizontal wells, and strangely, it's the applicant that seems to be on the side of postponement. Uh, usually if people are trying to uh, engage in uh, what should we call delay tactics, it's, it's the opponents or the people protesting. So uh, I think there's a little bit of an effort here for somebody to try and point the finger or to have blame. And I, I don't think for my own personal uh, peace of mind that it's the agency that uh, has a problem. I think the economy has a problem, the price of oil has a problem, and and uh, some of these people that had these prospects, either they can't get their financing together or it doesn't make sense. Uh, in other words, I don't think that uh, for that group of cases that there is a, a, a fault or a problem. Uh, but moving right along, that's the context within which we're, we're working. And then I had this case, which is one that I had posted over a year and a half ago uh, as an example of an old case. At that time, and I repeated for today's posting, essentially the posting that was done in January of 2019, and uh, at that time it, I had put down that it was 12 years old, now the correct um, calculation would be closer to 14. But here's a question. Why would a case that started over 14 years ago still be unresolved? And probably the, as I attached to the agenda, this two-page concurring opinion gave more of the detail of the history. On the last page, this case has gone with a, a recommendation from an administrative law judge and supported by the appellate referee. It went to the Court of Civil Appeals and the Supreme Court, and then it went to federal court, uh, Judge Cawthorn in the Western District, and then it went to the Tenth Circuit, and all six of those layers have indicated that there's been inaction at the commission and that the jurisdiction to resolve the case needs to be uh, at the commission. So I don't know that I can think of a case that in the last 30 years where you've had all of those levels of appeal and review come back to this agency and say, you're off base. Now, I've admitted in this two-page filing that I'm one of the ones that made a mistake, if you want to look at it that way, because it was a two to nothing vote on uh, um, 2006. And uh, since then, I've learned a lot about some of these legal cases that apply. Um, and yes, this case involves uh, fraud, and it involves the integrity of the agency. So is there anything more important to this agency than uh, 
the integrity of our uh, court operation or our uh, decision making. And I think in some regards, people considering honest government is as important as anything you do uh, get in the daily work uh, accomplished is important. So this this case uh, and, and some of the parties argue that uh, the fraud has been proven. It's been litigated. It's final uh, decision uh, has been reached. Now, uh, the other side wants to argue that that's not true. And but but we have now let a couple of years go by and it didn't get uh, resolved again. And I know we sent it to a particular ALJ, and that ALJ is not with us any longer, but it's still on the list. And if people wanted to know, uh, do you have any old cases, this is one of the oldest ones. And uh, are you looking at 2006, 4826? That's uh, that Mewborn yes. Oil Company of Pooling. Uh, the cause number is 2006, correct? Yes. 2006-4826. Okay. Um, and, and attached to the, the kind of summary of some of the main I issues or cases uh, is the two pages that gives more detail. But so I'm, anyway, I'm it, kind of, if that's the case, I'm kind of the, we are current on that. I mean, the ALJ, which was a year or two ago, uh, in 2017, the ALJ and the referee was Andrew Dunn. ruled to um, or made recommendation that we combine the dismissal case uh, with the reopening case. That came to us, and within a week's time, we issued an order affirming the ALJ and and um, I think referee, and which opens the door then for the parties to begin prosecution of the case. They have not done so. It may be that we need to file. Uh, to dismiss the case back to, uh, based on uh, just lack of action on, right. I on might, parties. I might uh, change a couple of the words that you just used. Actually, there were two motions, not cases. There was a That's motion, correct. one wanted to dismiss, the other motion wanted to move forward, and the, the matter that came to us, and you're correct, we did issue an order, we said, and I think that was the recommendation of the ALJ, said, let's hear both of these cases at the same time. Correct. I, I, now, I said the word case. Let's hear both of these motions at the same time. And, and then uh, uh, Andrew Dunn was the ALJ, and he's not with us anymore. But since you brought that up, uh, if you look on the posting of this matter, uh, it says the U.S. Supreme Court decision and mentions this one called Hazel Glass, Hazel Atlas Glass. Okay, uh, just reading the, the sentence or two that's there. This is from the United States Supreme Court on this very thing. Surely it cannot be that preservation of the integrity of the judicial process must always wait on the diligence of litigants. They're, they're saying if, if the question is the integrity of your judicial process or this agency, that you don't have to wait on these litigants. The public welfare demands that the agencies of public justice be not so impotent that they must always be mute and helpless victims of deceit and fraud. Uh, there's allegations of fraud, intrinsic fraud, fraud that occurred in the courtroom uh, at this agency in this building. And, uh, you know, the, we need to take this personally. This is our uh, fundamental constitutional obligation and responsibility. That's why I quote at the bottom there, Article 9, Section 18. It says, the Oklahoma Corporation Commission in the Constitution has the power and authority and the duty of correcting an abuse. If somebody com commits intrinsic fraud in one of our courtrooms, in one of our proceedings, it's up to us to make sure that something happens and to say, well, we told them to get, get on with it. Uh, whether they've 
been negligent, whether the economy has changed, so forth, uh, it doesn't matter to me. Uh, we have sent a signal that uh, you can be in, involved in fraud, and um, if you stall long enough, uh, nobody cares. And, and I do think this is related, though, to the current situation. And I've had somebody smarter than me try and explain it, that uh, when the economy's bad, when there are these uh, situations, uh, people get a little bit desperate, and maybe people would be tempted to uh, misrepresent uh, the facts and circumstance to their advantage. And we don't want them to think that we're soft on fraud. We want them to know that, by gosh, we take that seriously. And I didn't think I was going to try and tell this story. I can remember a day when I first got here. This whole room was full. And Jim Townsend once got real close to my face, and he said, don't you realize, young man, I don't think he called me young man. I'm not going to tell you what he called me. But he said, I've held every position at the House of Representatives except Speaker, and I only missed that by two votes. And my answer to myself was, well, so what? Uh, but anyway, there was a, a gentleman in the back of this room who stood up, and I guess it was like public comment, and he said in a loud voice, he said, you all are just a bunch of crooks, and you're all bought off by the special interests. Okay, so Townsend was chairman, and he immediately told him, he said, you just tell us right now, what are you talking about? Who are you talking about? When did it occur? Etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, I hardly ever say anything nice about Jim Townsend, but uh, I think it was appropriate if somebody is going to make an allegation that, uh, that you uh, call their hand on it. Anyway, uh, I think it's up to us to do something. It's an embarrassment to this agency that if 14 years went by and that all of these high courts have said, hey, if you want to say it that way, they said Anthony and one other commissioner got it wrong, and here's what you need to do. They're all pretty unanimous that we have a responsibility, and I'm just bringing it up one more time. I'll put it on my calendar a year and a half from now to bring it up again. Well, let me just kind of give you a rundown on on this order. It's It had come to my attention. Well, I mean, obviously it's been my attention for several years, but it uh, came back to my attention this morning, uh, an article an article in the uh, news uh, from an individual that uh, was making some of those comments and obviously did not understand the the uh, the case and and what's happening. But let me give you an exa let me give you the reason. Let me tell you explain to you why this case has lingered so long and that it's not on the commission that the case has lingered. From 2006 to 2008, the case was proceeding as normal. The Supreme Court ruled in 2008, and then the parties took no action from 2008 to 2014. At that point, Optima filed to reopen. They filed on January the 14th of 14. And then Optima continued their own uh, motion to reopen continued that 28 times, which took us to 2017. Uh, there was an ALJ ruling, 1017 of 17, that was to combine and uh, combine the motions and proceed with the case. And the commissioners on 1027, only 10 days, it only took us 10 days, then we affirmed the ALJ and the ref and said, okay, parties, you can move forward. So at this point, the parties have have not done anything to prosecute this case, and so are you suggesting that we bring a dismissal action for uh, failure to prosecute, or what would you what would you suggest that we do? Um, I think there's probably lots of options. I think the ALJ would have been a little more aggressive about it. He could have told folks, uh, uh, "Let's get going with it." Um, I think that the agency could probably uh, issue uh, some kind of enforcement action about the fraud. And that would take a decision uh, that we agree with one of the courts and one of the pleadings that said 
that uh, it's already been litigated and it's already been decided. Now, I'm not saying that's the best alternative. I'm just saying it is an alternative that we could initiate an enforcement action because of the allegation of fraud at the commission. And we could do it, and then we don't have to wait and see if uh, parties are going to get around to it. Hey, I've seen some things uh, more so on the trucking side. Sometimes parties have uh, strong claims against somebody, and they go outside this building and they negotiate with one another or trade off or, or have uh, arrangements. Uh, and that's, that's fine when what they have at interest is their property rights and their pocketbook. But when they uh, have the reputation of this agency and whether or not we're a bunch of crooks and whether or not we put up uh, with uh, fraud on the court, then I think that uh, just like this uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, Hazel Atlas Glass says that um, it's uh, not up to the private litigants or their uh, speed that should resolve the matter. So that's one approach. I bet there's some smart people on staff that uh, can think of other things uh, that could be done. Well, we have opened the door. Um, anyway, you may recall last time we did this, I had two cases. The other one was brought up by Attorney General uh, Drew Edmondson, and he alleged that there was uh, a lack of integrity to our process. <laughs> and we had a lot of big me meetings about it, and this room was full of people, and he had some rulemaking that he suggested. Uh, but uh, that rulemaking uh, was dismissed eventually. Well, Commissioner uh, Hyatt, I just yes. have one. I, I pulled out the order that we issued on October 27th, and what we did in that particular order was we consolidated the motions to reopen the motion to reopen with the motion to dismiss so it would go back to an ALJ so the situation is there's people that employees that come and go from this particular agency so if that particular ALJ was not available to, to hear it then to me it would be the responsibility of the division to assign another ALJ to actually hear those. So I think that's part of what the situation is. Our last order consolidated two motions to be heard, and those two motions have not been heard by an ALJ. So it seems to me like the next step to follow through with what we did would be to have the uh, court division downstairs assign an ALJ to hear it, because this has happened before where we have ALJs that leave and we sent and something's in front of them and then you got to put somebody else to make a decision. So that's what it seems to me like based on our order of 2017 what would need to be done. Because otherwise think, we've got two pending motions that I are just I think open. that makes sense. And by the way, uh, Patricia Wigan was the referee, I think, that that affirmed the recommendation that, that um, uh, Andrew Dunn had to hear them together. So she's got familiarity. She's at a senior level. I think she gets things done. So the yeah. reason I bring that issue up is because there's another case that we remanded and the judge that it was remanded back is no longer in that position. So it's kind of the responsibility for them to look and see and assign a new ALJ. So this would seem to be similar to me to that. But the party would need to file for a procedural schedule and uh, but what I'm saying we is we can appoint an ALJ, but that really doesn't accomplish anything unless. But what we said was, that. yeah, what we said was that the motions need to be consolidated to be heard. So it seems like they would be going back to a docket, and if people don't show up to prosecute it, that's the issue then. Right. But we've we've done an order that consolidated the motion. So somehow it's got to get back up on a particular docket. And if somebody doesn't prosecute it, then you'll deal with the next step after that. But uh, at this point, I don't think we ought to encourage people if, oh, if you're just tired with it, or if the economic, it's a pooling case. Well, if the economics of drilling a well these days uh, has changed, uh, 
that doesn't matter. You've, I mean, and I think it's a strong statement been reviewed by these higher courts that um, the the fraud, the, the fact of there being fraud, uh, I think one party has strongly uh, argued has been decided. It's not an alleged fraud at this point. It's one that's been established. And then the next question is, okay, now what are you going to do about it? Now, if I'm not reading that right, that's why I put a little qualification. Uh, so anyway, I don't think, uh, how does it make us feel if uh, we say, well, I sure hope those parties get around to this pretty soon, uh, and then they never do. Then it's back to our agency having proven fraud that occurred here, and we just don't seem to care about it. Anyway, I think it's kind of like a, uh, as basic a thing. But I, I, uh, you asked me what the alternatives are. Yes, we could ask somebody to initiate an enforcement action or something. I think what you suggested is uh, is a, a better approach. And and. We don't have, to, it's just like this says, we don't have to wait for the parties to get around to scheduling things. Now, I, I have just a tiny bit of experience with federal court. The federal judge says, here's the date. He doesn't ask if it's convenient. He doesn't ask if your daughter's going to graduation that day. He says, uh, be here. And so th these are still uh, active cases involving important issues. Well, I'm still not sure that the court that sent it back even understands what the limits of the jurisdiction of this commission are. The Tenth Circuit? Yeah, I'm not sure that they understand <laughs> that I don't, I don't know what kind of sanctions or whatever they think are appropriate, but this commission can't even enforce companies that don't pay a pooling bonus. We don't have the ability to do that because that's collection on a debt. So the thought, I don't know what kind of sanctions would be appropriate. I had, I don't know that it's relevant to the matter, but I just had my office look to see if Optima was even a bonded operator currently in Oklahoma, and it's not. It's still listed as active with the Secretary of State's office, but it's not listed. It had a bond out here at one time, but it doesn't now. Now, that might not be germane to the pooling itself, but... Do you think it would be appropriate to, for us to... Uh, I think our rules let us even pick ALJs, and you don't have to be an attorney to do to be. One. I, I don't know that I really feel prepared that we make. I appreciate that you well, brought it, it up, say. and I, I think it's just I think there's some different options. But on one hand, you know this is a private rights issue. I mean, pooling of lands involves a particular landed issue. It's not some statewide issue. The issue of what you've talked about with the fraud. You know, no matter where that occurs, that's that's an issue. But um, it seems to me like I think even if the ruling came out and the parties work together and resolve something themselves, I think they can do that. So um, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I kind of agree with Commissioner Hyatt. The party that was the moving party made all these continuances. I'm 28, I think, right? 28 or 29. So um, but I think. That, but all that misses the central point. It's it's our agency. It's a constitutional responsibility. Say, I can remember this. This agency hired Professor Harold Levinson, God rest his soul, of the Vanderbilt Law School, and uh, he represented us in a case, and he could quote all the 50 states and all of their jurisdiction, and I think he said that Oklahoma has the strongest jurisdiction. He says you're constitutional. Right there in the Constitution, it says you can hold people in contempt. He had about five different things, and he said every tribunal has the jurisdiction to uh, protect or maintain its own integrity. Uh, if somebody jumps up in the middle of a proceeding and says, here, I want to give $100 or $1,000 to each of the commissioners, uh, we have the authority not to say, uh, oh, I guess we better call the bar or somebody. We have the, the authority to um, do something. So anyway, I think that's a key issue, and uh, it's, it's as fundamental an issue, and that's how I felt the, in January of 
2019 and when you all started talking about old cases? Uh, do you know of one that's older than this? I think this is the oldest case that I can come up with since we did away with Drew Edmondson's rulemaking. And uh, it's an embarrassment that, uh, that it's uh, so old. I, I, in a management sense, there's a problem that we don't have some sort of listing that has things like this come up. Uh, you know, this is maybe an unusual category, and I don't, I don't know. Well, uh, I'm sure you would understand that I am, I am a bit cautious on these cases uh, because when I first came to the commission, um, the AT&T case came to light, and uh, well, it came to light in 1986, but but uh, was revisited. Um, by you, Commissioner Anthony, right. and out of respect for you, um, my office gave eight months to research that issue, and and I have no regrets in that um, because I had to make up my mind on my own. I had to do the research. I couldn't just. I had ten thousand people telling me it's crazy to even look at that case again and all of that. Well, it didn't matter what they said. I had to do that research and I had to look at it myself, and I did, and I have no regrets. But in the middle of in the middle of the research, I realized that here's a case that's from 1986 that is being brought up again in 2015 when I arrived at the commission. And then I look and realize the commission itself, including Commissioner Anthony, had voted twice. Well, Commissioner Anthony, I think, voted once, but the commission as a whole voted twice to affirm and move on with that case. And so, so yes, I, it's, it's, I, I think I should be cautious about going down a pathway on something that may not, may not have merit. Right. I, th this isn't posted for a vote today. Correct. I think uh, there's Michelle and others that have responsibilities. They can think about it and give us some advice. And further, I mean, when there's a political press release that goes out the morning of, these, of this posting uh, referencing this case, I, you know, I think that it gives reason to be cautious uh -huh. because apparently there are a lot more moving parts than I know of. Anything further? I think we've uh, had discussion and review. Thank you. All right. Will there be any new business? Uh, Commissioner yes, Hyatt, Murphy. if we could go back to my maybe vote. Yes. Okay. I have had the opportunity with the assistance of the aides from the other office in my office to see the version that I understand now was voted on. So since the meeting hasn't closed and I had a maybe vote, I'm ready to vote yes. So Peggy, I would um, let you know on the order that we took up, the third interim order in GD 2021, uh, my vote would be yes. So I appreciate my colleagues for accommodating me because I wanted to make sure I knew what I was voting on. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Murphy. Uh, Peggy, are you on the line? Did you get that information? And to the extent it's necessary, I uh, concur with uh, accepting that vote at this time. Peggy, did you, are you on the line? Yes, I am. I, I, okay. did, I did hear the vote. Okay, so you have three yes votes on that case. All right. Okay, will there be any new business to come before the commission? Saying none, the meeting's adjourned. Um, Commissioner Hyde, as I understood, we were going to take up some deliberations. Yes, can we uh, take a five-minute sure. break? Sure, sure. We'll take a five-minute break. I'm, I'm going to suggest that.